is incredible. Um, it shows that what PSD's actions um, have been about are not limited to just people who come to our events and people who are very actively part of our community. So this is sort of like a referendum on the way Harvard students are thinking about the issue in general. The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. This is the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman. And I'm Asa Win Stanley. Welcome back to the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman. On April 29th, the Harvard Crimson's editorial board published a statement in support of boycott, divestment, and sanctions and a free Palestine, in which they say that they now, quote, regret and reject their previous position that sidelined the Palestinian led BDS campaign. Quote, it is our categorical imperative to side with and empower the vulnerable and oppressed. We can't nuance away Palestinians' violent reality, nor can we let our desire for a perfect imaginary tool undermine a living, breathing movement of such great promise. They continue, two decades ago, we wrote that divestment was a blunt tool that affected all citizens of the target nation equally and should be used sparingly. Yet the tactics embodied by BDS have a historical track record. They helped, with, they helped win the liberation of Black South Africans from apartheid and have the potential to do the same for Palestinians today. The board also asserted that, quote, support for Palestinian liberation is not anti-Semitic, noting the, quote, wake of accusations suggesting otherwise. And as if on cue, those exact accusations poured in from Israel's defenders of apartheid, from former Harvard president and erstwhile Democratic Party official Lawrence Summers, to Israeli newspapers, to U.S. Senator Ted Cruz and the Anti-Defamation League. However, the former president of the Crimson, Daniel Swanson, remarked that it took tremendous courage for the paper to publish the statement. He said, quote, there's more debate in the Harvard Crimson editorial and room for both the main editorial and dissent than there is in the New York Times editorial page. So that's a very good sign. Joining us to talk about the student-led movement that helped lead the Crimson to this point and the backlash by Israel lobby groups and US politicians are two members of the Harvard Palestine Solidarity Committee, Nadine Bahur and Shraddha Joshi. And also joining us is Amaya Gelman. She's an activist researcher and a teacher at NYU who just wrote a crucial analysis on the dangerous role that the ADL and its CEO, Jonathan Greenblatt, play in emboldening the right wing's war against anti-racist activists. Amaya is also working on a book about the ADL. Thank you all for being with us today on the Electronic Intifada podcast. Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, Nadine and Shraddha, let's start with having you lay out your reaction to the Harvard Crimson taking this bold stance in support of Palestinian rights and admitting that they got it wrong in the past. Uh, the editorial board took note of the Palestine Solidarity Committee's campus organizing, and they say, quote, in at least one regard, PSC's spirited activism has proven successful. It has forced our campus and our editorial board to once again wrestle with what, with what both Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have called Israel's crimes against humanity in the region. Nadine, you're a senior. Um, can you talk about the steady direct actions you've been a part of at Harvard and the significance of the Crimson recognizing how student organizing led to their statement? Thank you for having us, Nuda. Um, for the past four years, ever, th ever since I started my time at Harvard, I've been very involved with the Palestine Solidarity Committee. Um, and as an international student from Palestine, specifically the West Bank, um, I really wanted to make sure that the lived experiences of Palestinians and that my identity is sort of portrayed during my experience at Harvard. And I I have the very unique perspective of sharing how I grew up and where I grew up with a population that might not even know where Palestine is. Um, and the Palestine Solidarity Committee has always been sort of a home for that kind of activism. Um, ever since my first year, we were able to organize our annual Israeli Apartheid Week, which is sort of what spurred um, the editorial this year. But alongside that, we also host a variety of speakers. We host a Palestine 101 event. Um, we organize rallies in support of our Divest campaign. Uh, we organize boycotts with for uh, different products that the university supplies that support Israeli apartheid, like Sabra Hummus on in our dining halls. Um, but we also want to highlight the culture that comes with Palestine. That's also very often a part of what is being stolen um, and what is what is a part of the Israeli apartheid. But uh, we host a lot of Dubkit events, which is traditional Palestinian dance. Uh, we try to do an embroidery workshop. 
Um, we try to highlight Palestinian food. And I think throughout my four years, half of it was online for sure, but the Palestine Solidarity Committee's uh, events continued to sort of be a main uh, part of my experience and something that we really wanted to make sure is portrayed on campus. Um, but of course, with every year, we try to highlight something different. There's always something happening. The news never leaves us looking for information or for anything to highlight. Um, and every year we sort of try to highlight a different thing through our Israeli apartheid week. And I think during my first year, there was a big emphasis on solidarity movements during online year um, with COVID. There was a lot to emphasize on in terms of the pandemic, but also in terms of the violence that was taking place in May, 2021 um, and throughout the summer. Um, and this year we really wanted to focus on BDS, on divestment. We wanted to uh, put all our efforts into our divestment campaign which we titled Harvard Out of Occupied Palestine. Um, and we really organized throughout the year for it. And IAW was sort of the icing on the cake for that um, in terms of really bringing speakers that highlight the apartheid um, that is on the ground, but also how Harvard is complicit in it. Um, and that really put the Crimson's editorial into perspective when it came out just a week after um, IAW, because we had been organizing for, for so long, we had been highlighting BDS for so long. And I think as a Palestinian student, I often felt that our voices were really marginalized, really just ignored by the Crimson. And in many times the Crimson was um, sort of uh, one of the forces that was working against PSC and was one of the forces that didn't allow us to publish anonymously, uh, would cover our uh, events in a very, quote unquote, neutral manner. Um, and we really sort of get slapped with like the anti-Semitic uh, label very quickly just for hosting certain speakers. Um, so I was very shocked when I saw the Crimson editorial that morning. Um, and I, I couldn't believe that the same body that um, only two years ago had said that the BDS movement is a blunt tool and something that um, they are not willing to back um, by a long shot in two years, saw PSC's activities, saw the students, voice, heard the students' voices on campus and decided to take a stance. Um, and the backlash that they're facing now is nothing new to PSC. I think what's interesting is I have been focusing so much on like my shock that the editorial came out and how excited I am about it. And I've really sidelined a lot of the backlash similar to a lot of PSC organizers, I think. Um, but then when you open any of the news or you talk to anyone in the Crimson right now, they're like, but the backlash and it's so much and how do you deal with that? And for some reason, I feel like I've only now started to notice how much we've normalized that. We, we sort of know what we're working towards and we're gonna keep putting our efforts into producing uh, more events and into sort of highlighting our mission rather than putting our efforts into fighting any of the backlash that's coming out um, and sort of the repeated accusations of X, Y, and Z of what we're doing. Um, but it, it really does highlight to the rest of the Harvard community sort of how it, what it feels like and how it is to organize for Palestine and that backlash is definitely something that needs to be kept in mind. Thanks, Nadine. Um, Shada, how important is it um, that a campus newspaper like the Crimson takes a stand in support of BDS? And what does this signal in terms of changing the paradigm on college campuses, um, especially high profile ones like Harvard, which as we know, and, and as Nadine pointed out, has relationships with Israeli institutions? Yeah, for sure. I think just to echo Nadine, um, after IAW was over this week, we were really proud about everything that had gone down, but I don't think anyone really expected that it would be recognized in such a way, especially because just after IAW, the direct um, article that was written by the Crimson was something along the lines of Israeli apartheid week draws backlash. And that was sort of the headline. And that was what was on the front page of the Crimson. And so a week later for this editorial to come out, was really shocking and in all pleasant ways, really surprising for us because um, we hadn't expected such an endorsement just given the years of precedent. You can look at a 2000 article, year 2000 article that essentially denies apartheid. And then you look at 2000, uh, 2020, which says that, you know, maybe human rights violations are happening. Maybe there are problems that are happening, but it would still be unfair to divest. And then you look at 2022 and they're really calling out these issues of apartheid settler colonialism, things that we've been calling on and things that PSC members have been calling on for decades. And so I think that the shift is incredible. Um, it shows that what PSC's actions um, have been about are not limited to just people who come to our events and people who are very actively part of our community, but rather um, I think for a lot of us, this is sort of like a referendum on the way Harvard students are thinking about the issue in general. And so I think for me personally, as someone who's not Palestinian, who has who's part of a lot of communities that aren't really engaged with the cause, to see these conversations sort of happening outside of our spaces, outside of organizing spaces is a validation. And I think that the Crimson Editorial 
has brought those conversations into the mainstream. And so then looking at that, looking at Harvard in relationship to other universities, um, obviously the fact that the Crimson was the one that endorsed this has just, the big name of the Crimson has drawn so much attention from outside of Harvard, um, whether that's good attention from people like Mohammed al-Kurd, Noura Arafat, people who are really you know engaged in these causes and are sort of at the front line of um, this type of advocacy. And then obviously the backlash from Zionist media, from um, politicians and stuff. But I think the fact that the Crimson has given this endorsement shows that something big is happening and that it's not just limited to PSC, to PSC at Harvard, but maybe more just, you know, students in general, campus life, um, campus organizers in general across the country who are bringing attention to these issues and gaining traction. Um, and I think it's a really a testament to the fact that young people are changing the way they think about Palestine. And um, I hope that, you know, the Crimson editorial will inspire other universities to sort of continue their dialogue about what's going on in Palestine and how that can be addressed on campus. And, you know, specifically to Harvard, I hope that this can be the starting point for us to reevaluate our relationship with occupation and for the administration to sort of take the pressure from students and um, look at what can be done in response. Thanks so much. Um, let's talk a little bit about the backlash and, and then I want to bring Maya into the conversation as well. Um, Nadine, Tell us about the level of vilification um, of the Harvard Crimson statement. What kind of backlash um, the editorial board and PSC has been facing and, and what that looks like. So the backlash has been sort of, at least from my perspective, very similar to a lot of the things that we've seen. I think we now live in a world where everything is happening on Instagram, on Twitter, on podcasts, but so much of it is always at your fingertips at any hour of the day. Um, and I think, there's always been a lot of backlash that has happened towards PSC social media and towards PSC as an institution. Um, but what is always so much more disheartening to see is the backlash that students face personally. Um, and I think as, as much as I don't like to say this, but I've gotten more used to it, um, or at least I see it coming, like you said, like it's like as if it comes on cue and it, uh, you know that it's coming and you accept the fact that you have to deal with it. Um, and as much as this shouldn't be the case, um, I think PSC members have been doing this for four years and it's become a little bit more um, expected, but I think the backlash that the Crimson editorial members and the Crimson as a whole um, with all its members and its president is facing has been absolutely, horrendous um for for beginners the the students didn't think that you they you write under the crimson editorial board's name because this is an anonymous group of sort of students that can do it and um they get to publish under the editorial's name but that security that you get that when you publish about anything else under the editorial's name immediately goes away with palestine um i remember the second day or the third day after the editorial came out there was this instagram page of someone just taking screenshots of everyone's personal accounts, everyone's social media and exposing them and um, saying truly horrific things about them. And so many of these people were not people were not even involved in that editorial. They're just a part of the Crimson, which is a huge organization and it's the largest newspaper, newspaper um, in college campuses. Um, and I think that vilification and that personal targeting um, is just another example of how Zionists of how any backlash that organizing for Palestine faces is not usually coming for the ideology as much as it's coming for the people for making you for wanting to push you out of this doing this work and it's absolutely scary and I think it doesn't matter even as someone who expects it every time I publish something under my name. I see some of the comments I see some of the articles that are written and I'm like, do I really want to keep doing this is this going to be like my whole life. Um, and I think it's really hard to come to terms with that when you're still finding your identity and when you're still finding your footing in college. Uh, we might be 20 plus years, years old, but I think it's still really hard to figure out where you, how you want to sort of figure out your relationship with politics and, and sort of with being publicly like a, a facing figure. Um, I think that's, that's one part of it. I think the other part of it, especially for PSC members who want to voice their opinion, who want to stand in support of the Crimson and who want to like, publish more op-eds in the Crimson um, speaking against the backlash are just unable to do so because they can't have their name out there because they either want to go back home over the summer or they are on a student visa in the US and can't risk that because they want to continue their education. Um, and I think that really always just makes you look at everything from a bird's eye perspective and realize the, the privilege that Zionists have in terms of speaking loudly and proudly and the power that those voices have. Whereas the oppressed voices that do want to speak up in solidarity of that um, 
of Palestinians and, and in solidarity with the Crimson are just unable to do so. Um, and I think that's sort of from a, from a bigger perspective on Harvard's campus in specific, and in terms of the backlash that um, students are facing, it's it's always, I think specifically this year, uh, been so much more clear how institutionally backed this uh, this backlash is from, from Harvard, from prominent, loud, and, and, and very powerful voices on campus, uh, and how we're at the end of the day, a student organization, um, and we're just a group of students that are passionate about one thing and wanna call for uh, sort of the liberation of Palestine, and we're faced by, uh, by people on Harvard's payroll that are telling us that what you're doing is, is problematic and you're alienating students and you are, are, are calling for X, Y, and Z um, and, and things that are just not even worth repeating on a, on a space like this. Um, I think it really puts into perspective how the power imbalance that exists between Palestinian student organizers um, and everyone else in the Harvard sphere, which echoes, as I think most of the Harvard, most of the college campuses in the US is absolutely, um, very challenging to deal with and very imbalanced. Um, and I think that that backlash will continue to come um, even now as we respond to, the, to, to the, the editorial and as we try to share more of our perspective. Um, but I think one thing that we always talk about in PSC is that it doesn't matter how much of this backlash comes, it doesn't matter how many editorials are written and how many um, Instagram accounts and comments and whatever you want comes towards PSC. Um, I think we've, we've managed to figure out that the, the, the answer to all of this is just to channel it into speaking louder, into organizing more events, into holding IAW again, uh, and into writing more. Um, and that's the, the most constructive way to do it and the way that we'll continue doing it. Thanks, Nadine. Um, Amaya, you've been tracking the kinds of backlash uh, Nadine and Sharada uh, were just talking about by, is, by Israel lobby groups and the Israeli government itself, and one particular lobby group um, working tirelessly to denounce student activism in support of Palestinian rights has been the ADL, a right-wing lobby organization masquerading as a civil rights group. Um, its CEO, Jonathan Greenblatt, has been on a tirade recently trying to smear anti-Zionist activists, anti-racist organizers as racists. And you know, as you've pointed out uh, over the, the, you know, the last several years, this is not a new tactic, obviously, but his recent actions are becoming increasingly dangerous, um, as you point out in your latest post on Medium. Um, he said of the Crimson editorial that it is outrageous to equate Zionism with white supremacy and that the editors show no understanding of the region's past or present. You're writing a book on the ADL. Um, what are your initial thoughts on that group's smear campaign against the Crimson editors and against um, students uh, like Nadine and Shraba? Um, well, the day before, I think the day before the Crimson editorial on May 1st, um, the CEO of the ADL, Jonathan Greenblatt, um, conducted a, a national meeting, sort of a pre-hyped national meeting, where he announced that he was going after student groups, including Students for Justice in Palestine, um, and also a few other organizations, um, Jewish Voice for Peace, then CARE, and also Drop the ADL, which is a coalition of anti-racist organizations. Um, and that he that he was he was announcing that the ADL was essentially going to war um, <clears throat> with organizations that that uh, challenged Zionism and that he was sort of walking away, the ADL was walking away um, from, the, from previous claims that it was allied with anti-racist movements. In fact, um, uh, one or two years ago, the ADL um, joined in a, a letter that had been organized where several hundred Jewish organizations signed on to, um, to identify Black Lives Matter as a new civil rights movement, which was kind of a walk back of a previous um, round of attacks on Black Lives Matter for making, um, making common cause and identifying solidarity um, with Palestinians against racist policing. So that there had been a sort of um, an effort by the ADL, and not just not just the ADL, but but major Zionist institutions um, more generally, to try and um, to try and make some uh, common cause with anti-racist movement groups, as Black Lives Matter and anti-policing protests became the sort of core of um, of civil rights politics in the U.S. And as they increasingly um, helped people understand the connections between racism in the US and Israeli racism, Israeli apartheid and, um, and Palestinian 
like discussions of what what the, what was happening and how it was related um and that all went away that on may 1st it was gone that was the the mask was off um jonathan greenblatt announced very specifically that he was um that he was doing that that he was characterizing anti-zionism as anti-semitism without exception um and um that he named these three primary organizations and drop the ADL as a coalition. And he did he did it in language that's Cold War language. It's, it was really, I mean, it was kind of funny, but not funny. <laughs> um, he called, he called uh, the idea that anti-Zionism was a challenge to state violence, uh, Soviet disinformation, um, really echoing the words of the Christian right as it challenges um, critical race theory, supposed critical race theory and education, um, calling critical race theory and teaching about race a Marxist plot and socialist plot. Um, so that was the day before the Crimson editorial. And so it was not a surprise when when his next move, when the ADL's next move was to smear the Crimson um, and to call the editorial sort of childish. And I can't remember what he said exactly. Um, he called it, he said it was like wrong and didn't understand. And that's been the ADL's approach um, generally to when uh, when anti-racist statements come out, when um, when uh, organizations or um, or movement groups come out to say, like, look, we have to take a stand on BDS or on Palestinian liberation, not necessarily specifically to Palestinians, but because we have to oppose racism and colonialism and state violence. The ADL's response is, sit down, children. You don't know what you're talking about or you're evil and you're anti-Semites, but the, the effect is the same. Um, it's not new. The ADL has been attacking the left for a long time and, in, and it's been attacking um, civil, rights, civil rights groups for a long time, even as it purports to be a civil rights organization. But the thing that's really interesting about this moment and that I think um, that we're seeing in the, in the way that the um, that the Crimson's editorial sh like shows a shift is that the whole conversation about, about race and rights in the US has changed because of Black Lives Matter and the sort of popularization of ideas like structural racism and colonialism. Like um, the ADL has had to, and again, also Zionist organizations more broadly, and especially those who are trying to target millennials um, have turned to this language about, um, you know, Jews are indigenous to Palestine um, and Jews are not white and Jews must be included in, um, in your, if you are anti-racist and you're saying that Jews are white, you're a racist and this doesn't make sense. So it's trying to sort of um, insert Zionism into the new anti-racist politics and it fails on its face. And so then it, I think what that has done is it has made space for uh, for people who didn't previously understand why BDS was important or why the ADL was wrong to, to, to question them. So I think the ADL is in a terrible position right now, um, trying to enter into that civil rights space at the same time as it's also, as Zionism is becoming more and more um, a pet of white supremacists, it's just not working. So I think this, the, the backlash um, was not a surprise, but also I think the PSC approach that we're hearing from Sharda and Nadine is absolutely like, it makes total sense, like just keep going because the ADL's messaging is just, it's falling flatter and flatter and they're losing more and more of their audience. You also write in your piece that it's it's not only wrong and you know on its face as you say, but um, but that it's also seriously dangerous. Um, that the ADLs, um, you know, give giving a pass to right wing, you know, racist anti Palestinian organizations um, will have uh, really really pernicious, dangerous effects. Can you talk a little bit about that and and um, and you know how you see the ADL's war on anti-racism now playing out. It, um, yes, that the ADL has a long history as um, an anti-communist and a Cold War organization, and that sounds a little dated and irrelevant, maybe. But the the nature 
of US politics right now and the way that the that white nationalism is defining itself is actually in terms of the Cold War. It's it's weird, but it's true. There's so the Cold War frame of mind is like the, the United States and the West against the scary East, right? There it's full of it anti-communism tra translates very well into Islamophobia because there's the idea of the United States is it's capitalist and it's there's a whiteness to it, right? And a Christianity, um, and it's pitted against this sort of foreign, scary, um, not Christian, not capitalist East. Um, and that's the, the core of white nationalism. And even though the ADL in its in, in his speech, Greenblatt compared um, anti-Zionism to QAnon, right? So he was trying to, he was trying to make out that it's racist. He was trying to play into a trope. But in fact, his base is probably closer to QAnon than, than, than anything. Um, we know that Christian Zionists have a have a very close overlap with QAnon. We know that the ADL is busily um, uh, fighting, leading the fight against ethnic studies in California um, and spreading that fight elsewhere across the country. Um, that fight, the people who are opposing ethnic studies in California are opposing it on the grounds that it's critical race theory and Marxist, right? So these are <clears throat> the, the idea of calling anti-racism Soviet disinformation or calling anti-Zionism Marxist is a way of, of signaling that the ADL is, is um, sort of giving permission or, or dog whistling to white nationalist organizations that it's okay and desirable to target anti-racist movement groups. And we know that white nationalists are armed. We know that not just white nationalists, but, um, but also that um, Zionist nationalists and historically the Jewish Defense League are armed, that they're not interested in US law because they're, they view themselves as accountable to a higher authority, right? This is dangerous. They're inviting and, and and in some ways inciting violence. Now, I want to be really careful about what I'm saying. I'm not saying that Greenblatt said go out and harm somebody. But historically, the organizations that the ADL has demonized have then become the targets of of people who have done bombings and murders. So yeah, I'm, I, I'm legitimately terrified and I open my mailbox slowly. I'm not kidding. Like, I, it's incredibly dangerous. Thanks for that. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, Nadine and Shraddha, how does this level of outright targeting of anti-Zionist, anti-racist organizers on campuses um, from Harvard to Berkeley affect students? And, and how can, can they and, and you as members of PSC be empowered to fight back? What's your next steps here? Yeah, so I think like one of the conversations we've been having a lot is when we say fighting back, like who is our audience? Like who's the audience of our activism? Who do we direct our energy and our efforts towards? And I think one thing that we've sort of come to realize is that we're not necessarily trying to respond to the alumni who are going to send letters to the Crimson saying things that are saying things that are racist, saying things that are sort of denying Palestinian suffering that are just so oblivious to what's going on on the ground, because in the end, we really do want to capitalize on this movement, which is that students are having these conversations and that students are starting to listen and realize that there is a connection between Black Lives Matter and between what's going on in Palestine and that we as Harvard students, um, as a lot of us as Americans are directly complicit in this type of oppression. And so I think trying to focus on solidarity building and to have that at the student level is something that we can do a lot more tangibly and something that we can do a lot more effectively because as we talked about the backlash and the people that we're up against are in places of power considerable power more than us. And so while we can, you know, look at the Crimson op-eds or look at people who have been tweeting about us in the end, I think that it's a lot better and just a lot more effective for us to put our efforts into what's going on on the ground. And I think something that's almost heartening is the fact that, so last year in um, wake of everything that happened in May, 2021, there was a Harvard Stands with Israel petition. But if you look at the majority of the names, a lot of them were alumni and more than, there are definitely a lot more alumni than Harvard students. And so, while obviously that means that there are people in positions of power who have that viewpoint. It also means that younger people aren't espousing those viewpoints and that people who are vocal about 
you know, opposing the Crimson editorial, a lot of them are people who graduated from Harvard 20, 30 years ago and are really not connected to the reality of student activism and to what's going on on campus now. And so while we will always be getting hatred and getting, you know, these sorts, sorts of slander and, and a lot of pushback from people who are extremely Zionist and just don't hold the even the space to sort of have this conversation and have this dialogue, I think we should be dedicating our attention towards the majority who might be unengaged or might be sort of on the fence, say that things are complicated and to show them that, you know, it's not complicated. Here's what Palestinians are saying. Here's the evidence. Here's what human rights organizations are saying. And I think having that standpoint has been a lot more effective. And that's probably what's led to this moment, this just watershed moment of um, the Crimson editorial. And um, that's also why it's just the beginning and why we want to continue bringing this conversation to students um, rather than, you know, worrying too much about what others are saying from positions of power. Nadine, did you want to add to that? I completely agree with all of this. I think the, the, the emphasis that I would add is on the point of the students, the current population at Harvard and their current viewpoints. I think it, it's even much faster turnover than, than you might imagine. I think during my four years here, the conversations I used to have with people my first year are nowhere near the conversations I'm having now three and a half years later. Um, and, I, and I think that speed at which students are uh, willing to listen to others, at the speed at which students are willing to act and show that BDS could work. I think there, there's this trip that's funded by the Harvard Hillel uh, over a spring break to Israel. It's like 10 days of a, free, of a free trip that's open to anyone and everyone in the Harvard population. And we started a boycott campaign this year. Um, and we also launched a boycott campaign two years ago when uh, we were in person. And that year, no one sort of would talk to us. No one would sit with us at the table to like listen to our perspective and no one boycotted. And this year, five students boycotted. And they showed you that BDS has the potential to work. Five out of 100 might not be a lot, but five is way more than zero. Um, and I think it's really important to put into perspective the students that are listening to other activists on campus and the students that are willing to listen to student experiences and lived experiences of Palestinians and to really center those Palestinian voices. Um, I think the whole argument that you need to go see this injustice in order to believe it, in order to confirm that everything you're reading about in the news is real and then you're gonna take a stance um, is very quickly losing its footing and as people are just very quickly starting to listen to Palestinian students. And I think we need to also center the fact that Harvard needs to invite more Palestinian professors, more Palestinian scholars, accept, accept people into their community that are willing to share that perspective. Um, and they've done a, a decent job so far, given that I'm here. I think I, I have to say that, uh, but I think there's a lot of room for a lot of teaching to be given from a different perspective rather than only accepting students because student activism is very important and very critical. Uh, but like we were saying, it's always met with institutional backed uh, opposition and that shift needs to happen very quickly. And I think one more thing I'd add is that since we are very much tied to the BDS campaign, everything that we do comes from a precedent. And, you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, there was a lot of activism around apartheid South Africa, and that was met with incredible institutional backlash. But then there was also faculty support and there's also a rising base of student support. And so I think if we can use that to sort of guide our activism now, which is what we do always strive to do. Um, I feel like we are moving in a positive direction because we've gotten a lot of student support. Um, there are faculty who are really excited about this editorial and who are willing to stand with us. And I just can't imagine how this will just kind of keep increasing throughout the years. Thank you, Shraddha and Nadine. And Amaya, did you have um, anything else you'd like to, to say about the current moment that we find ourselves in right now? Yeah, I just I want to just pick up on this um, this sort of dichotomy that Nadine and Shada are talking about, where there's on the one hand there's these sort of incredible gains in um, in understanding of um, of Palestinian like struggle and what's going on, and on the other hand, this increasing repression from from institutions of power, and that's the case with the ADL as well. So on the one hand, the ADL is losing its credibility, it's losing its base, and on the other hand, it's actually been really successful in using. The language of hate and you know stopping hate, um, and and it's um, sort of you know cooking the books on discussing anti-Semitism, which as we know like stats on anti-Semitism sort of roll in and any criticism of Israel and sort of imply that that actually that those incidents are um, are incidents that put Jews in danger, which we know is not true, and they've been really successful in in using that to. Um, to increase their, their institutional power. So even as they lose their base, they're increasing their institutional power. And one piece of evidence of that is the fact that Deborah Lipstadt was just confirmed as the, the US anti-Semitism czar, envoy, whatever her official title is, which is quite a powerful um, position with, with no accountability. Um, and the one of the things that Greenblatt 
promised in his speech on May 1st was that basically he was going to be engaging in lawfare against student groups. And so to have lawfare, um, you know, up their sleeve and to have um, a, a very powerful voice in the US government to have media still consuming these statistics on anti-Semitism as if they as if their truth with really no investigation of what they actually mean. Um, the ADL is actually in a, and, and I, when I say the ADL, I actually mean a sort of much larger ecology of organizations, right? I'm not just talking about the ADL, is actually in quite an institutionally powerful position. Um, and so it, the building this sort of, building up the, um, building the base of opposition at the, at the popular level just becomes so incredibly important and the work, supporting the work of students um, and supporting their resistance, like putting money into the fighting of the lawsuits, which will definitely have to happen, um, just is incredibly, incredibly important because we're in this pivotal moment. So I really wanna just like big up the work of the students. And also just a pitch, if anybody wants to <laughs> look at the materials and drop the ADL.org, that is also available. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Maya Gelman. You are a, uh, P, uh, yeah, you, you finished your PhD and you're actually teaching now at NYU and you have a forthcoming book on all of this research that you've been engaging in for the last few years. Um, and uh, Nadine Bahur and Shraddha Joshi from Harvard's Palestine Solidarity Committee. Thank you all for, for everything you do. Are there any um, social medias that you'd want? We have the dropTheADL.org website, but um, for, for if people want to get in touch or support Harvard PSC, where can they go? In the Instagram world, at Harvard PSC is the easiest way, and that's our um, username for all social media as well. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for being with us today on the Electronic Intifada podcast. Thanks, Nara. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.